everybody. This is Claire Corwin. She works at the Alzheimer's Association. She's stationed out of Buffalo and um, we connected at one of her events um, a couple weeks ago at the library. And um, June is Alzheimer and Brain Awareness Month. So we asked her to come in and do a presentation. With my fingers crossed, I'm gonna attempt a screen share, but I can't guarantee anything. Oh. Heather, can you adjust the camera so all we can see literally are your heads? Oh, can you can you see the, the, the board? No, you can't. No. I oh. can see your head. And I can see the camera the, that you're videoing with. Okay, let me find the, oh, here it is. Okay, hold on. All right. I think this is it. Then again, maybe not. Makes me feel better that you guys aren't here in person. I was just telling Heather I stopped to let my parents' dog out and she destroyed my shoes. So, <laughs> oh, geez, I'm gosh. looking a little funky underneath the table today. So if all you get is Who my cares? <laughs> Then you're all set. I, I know. I told her uh, I, I wouldn't have even noticed because that's just. All right. I'm trying to adjust the camera here. Can you open back up the screen so you can see? Oh, there we go. How's oh, that? There you go. Better? That's so much better. Okay. All oh, right. Put your video on. Done, can you? Oh, can uh, I not? I'm sharing the screen. Can you guys see the screen? No. I don't know if you're sharing it. Oh. It says share screen. Okay. Okay, and then you click on whatever it is you want to share. Um, some things should populate. Just the Alzheimer's one? Mm-hmm. Oh, you clicked out of that. I sure did. All right, hold on, everybody. My apologies. There we go. All right, that, okay, so then I go back to Zoom and I, to be able to share my screen, right? You guys see it now? No. No. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Says share screen. Ta -da. Ta da! You got it. Okay. So this is Claire. Thank you, Claire, for your patience. Um, and she's going to talk about the Alzheimer's Association and Alzheimer's. So let me, maybe, try and start. Okay, you want to, okay. All right. All right, we'll hey, Heather. Everyone. Yeah. It's Barb. Kathy's here, too. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, as Heather said, my name is Claire. I work for the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I've been doing this for about six years, about two years in Buffalo, or I guess two and a half, really. Um, so the way that our organization is set up is a little confusing to some folks, so I really like to boil it down to Western New York. Um, we are a national organization, but we're split up by chapters. And each chapter office is a little bit different. I like to brag, um, truthfully, because Western New York is really lucky. We have a really generous community that funds a lot of services that we'll talk about today that aren't necessarily covered um, in other chapters or, or offered around the country. So. When we talk about the things that we do, some of these live through a certain grant cycle, some of these are only you know, geographically based. Um, so I always tell people if you have a question about something specific, call our office rather than our national helpline. So we will go ahead and get started. I do like to talk a little bit about our impact as a national organization. We are the leading voluntary health organization that really fights Alzheimer's disease, tries to look for that cure, but also supports all of our caregivers. And that's really upheld in our mission, which is to accelerate research, drive that early risk reduction and early detection, um, and maximize our quality care and support. So when we think about all of these things, we think research, usually when people say the Alzheimer's Association, they say, oh, the walk. And we say, oh, yes, but that's only part of it. But the walk funds a lot of what we do here. One of the things that I always include um, when we're talking about Alzheimer's disease right from the start is my job is really focused on diversity, equity, and health uh, and inclusion. And sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle of, of what we're doing. So when we think about those things, you know, risk, uh, research, and quality care and support, we know that there are some communities that are at a larger risk and face 
discrimination in healthcare um, due to a bunch of things that we could you know, speculate about on all day and discuss. But really it's important to note that all of these populations, uh, Black Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, LGBTQ, um, people who need assistance later in life, all of these different people have different struggles as it relates to discrimination in healthcare and, and even just getting the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So everyone's journey through this whole disease process, it's a long process for most people, is gonna look wildly different. So when we talk about things, I do like to boil it down a little bit to that too, just so we understand that really truly no one who goes through this has the exact same experience as the person next to them. Because um, that can be true when we talk about anyone with Alzheimer's disease. If you know one person with Alzheimer's, you only know that one person. Mine and Heather's brains, totally different. Totally different. So the way that anything progresses within us is going to be different because we have different lifestyles, we have different diets, we've had different experiences, and our brains are just built differently. So when we think about that, it's kind of nice to recognize that even though it is such a unique disease process and the way it affects people is so unique, we also know that we are not alone. So there are more than 6 million Americans who are living with Alzheimer's. Since this um, video, this presentation, the number is much higher. It's actually closer to about 8 million, and that's with people who are just diagnosed. This isn't with people who are in the middle stages and not able to receive an appropriate diagnostic process. They're not able to receive that support from their PCP to even get to that point. So we know then, if more than 6 million people were living with Alzheimer's and they had 11 million um, people providing that unpaid care, we know that that number is also likely much higher. So the impact is really crazy when you zoom out a bit. And I also like to drive home the cost of care. Anyone who's taking care of a loved one knows that it is very expensive. And our country has not done a great job in recognizing elder care as something that's necessary or something that falls to the healthcare system. It falls on the shoulders of the family who often work full time, who have lives, who have children, who have things that they need to do. Um, so when we look at the industry of Alzheimer's and dementia care, we see that unpaid number, but we also see that cost, that 355 billion, which is again, likely a lot higher. That number is projected to rise to the trillions. I, if you asked me what a trillion was, I really actually don't know. It's that big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I can't wrap my head around it. But you know, in 27 years, that's where we'll be with the cost of care and the way that the, the diagnosis trend is going. People are aging. We're, we're not getting any younger. We have the baby boomer population. We have all of these folks who are recognizing now that it's not someone being senile. It's truly dementia. So when we look at that, that cost you know, kind of does stick. Can you guys hear me okay? Everyone's good? Okay, perfect. Um, one of the facts that always surprises people too is that Alzheimer's is a fatal disease. When we talk about all of the things that affect us as people, especially as we age, we hear about a lot of chronic conditions, we hear about a lot of comorbidities, but no one ever says, oh, my grandpa died of Alzheimer's. And I understand that, A, it's a terrible thing to talk about. This is a hard thing to go through. And B, there's a lot of comorbidities that, that kind of sync up with it, and our brain is only as healthy as the rest of our body. So when we think about the ways that people do pass, typically we don't think of Alzheimer's in this way, but it is a fatal progressive brain disease. So one of the things we want to do is kind of change that narrative and let people know what we're facing. It's not just someone being forgetful, it's truly a degeneration of brain cells as we go along. Does anyone have any questions so far? I could talk about this all day, so when you guys need a break, let me know. Um, so does anyone know the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Just off the top of your head. No, I have no idea. Oh. Alzheimer's is some type of dementia. Yes, excellent, thank you, Heather. But that's okay because a lot of people actually really don't know that, and I hear them used interchangeably. Yep. Oh, my aunt has Alzheimer's and dementia. And I'm like, well, you're not wrong, but you're also not right. And let's talk about why it matters if they are wrong or if they are right. Um, so the way that I explain it to people is just like Heather said, Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. So if I asked Heather to go to the store and get some bread for me, she would get to Wegmans and she would say, okay, Claire, I'm at the bread aisle. There's white, there's wheat, there's sourdough, there's rye, there's cinnamon raisin if you're having a really good day. Like, There's all these different types, but they all are still bread, yes? 
Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. So just like dementia is our bread, Alzheimer's is our white bread. It's our most common. It's about 60 to 80 percent of diagnoses, and it's the thing that we are are really spearheading research with. Then that wheat bread, you know, the less common types that people might not pick up as much, but are still there and, and very prevalent, would be that Lewy body dementia, uh, vascular dementia, frontotemporal. So these are just the most common types. There are tons of types of dementia. These are what we see more often than not because they're A, easier to diagnose. They're, when I say easier, I don't always mean it's an easy process, but when they progress, it's easier to see the physical uh, components of them. So Lewy body dementia uh, specifically is caused by alpha-synuclein proteins that build up in the brain. It's a little bit more behavioral in nature. Um, it can mimic for a really long time signs of depression, anxiety, we see folks get a bit more aggressive with this type of dementia. Um, this is the one that Robin Williams had. Mm -hmm. So people associate that very quickly with him. Vascular dementia is caused by a lack of blood flow to a certain part of the brain. Vascular dementia is tricky because it's not always, it doesn't always follow the same progression as Alzheimer's or Lewy body would. Because again, it's that only that one part of the brain. So unless we're suffering certain types of concurrent strokes or lack of blood flow, Sometimes we see people almost pause for quite some time in a certain stage of the disease. And then we see frontotemporal dementia. This is the one that Bruce Willis has. So it's really, um, as you might guess, affects that front part of the brain. So a lot of word loss, aphasia. Um, again, a little bit more behavioral in nature, but it really comes with that frustration of losing more of the ability to communicate and articulate what we're feeling and process that. Um, and then, of course, when we think about Alzheimer's, this is caused by specific plaques and tangles that build up in the brain. So there's a tau tangle that builds up, and I almost think of it like if it snows in Jamestown, you're going to plow your primary streets first and then your secondary streets, but all of those other ones kind of get lost. So the tangles are our snow, and the more it snows, the harder it is to get through those pathways. So that's kind of the way that I imagine it going through. Um, because sometimes it's really difficult to look at someone who looks the same. You look fine to me, but I can't see what's happening. If I saw you and you had your left arm in a sling, I'm not gonna hand you anything to your left hand. But I can't see the progression in your brain, so to have some type of visual sometimes is really helpful in helping our patients, but also helping that compassion and, and kind of understanding what that person is going through. A little bit of empathy here goes a very, very, very long way. Does anyone have any questions on dementia versus types? No. No? Okay, wonderful. Yeah, you did a good, good job. Uh, so wow. <laughs> I better be at this point, right? <laughs> so I like to boil it down again even more um, to New York State because we are so well funded by the Department of Health here. They truly pay my paycheck for the most part um, and they make all of our programs free for anybody. They make it so that I can drive from Buffalo to Chautauqua and not think about it at all. Um, so when we look at New York State, again, since this has been published, this number is more likely about half a million people. And that's people who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It's not vascular dementia, it's not Lewy body dementia, it's Alzheimer's alone. So understanding that, that means we have, what, a million caregivers who are living, you know, unpaid, doing this work, doing the, the, the good work to help people get through their day-to-day -day lives, it's, it's very impactful. And that number is, of course, continues to grow um, as we understand how to diagnose people, we understand how to talk to the doctors, we're able to advocate for our loved ones, or even just able to accept it. Um, so when we look at that number, it's really hard to, sometimes for me, I get very caught up in the data, and it's really exciting because I can look at things and say, oh, that's working, that's not working, blah, 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 blah. But I think we sometimes lose that compassionate side of things when we dive into it like that. So one of the things that we do um, is we provide free education classes and uh, services so that people are able to give that compassionate care, that they have the tools to be able to say, okay, I'm imagining the snow on the streets, the, the proteins and, and tangles in the brain. I'm imagining this, it makes it easier for me to talk to this person. I teach a program called Effective Communication Strategies which you would think is pretty easy, but you see people all the time go, oh my gosh, I didn't think about that. 
50% of your communication is nonverbal, and we don't think about it at all because we're healthy. But if my tone was really just kind of disinterested, if I was just sitting here like this talking to you guys, I mean, how interested would you really be? Would you want to sit through the rest of this? No. So even things like that correlate to compassionate care, and it makes it much easier for people to say, oh, okay, so we'll go through a couple things, we'll practice it, um, and we'll go from there. But that's really one of the things that we personally want to drive home. It is compassionate care, but it's also giving yourself some compassion as a caregiver, as a professional. It's not always easy to see all of these things happen. Um, so like I said, in New York State, we're funded by the Department of Health. We are split up into seven chapters. So of course, we are Western New York. And any of the services that I'm gonna talk about that we offer, I will like, kind of earmark which ones are specific to Western New York alone. Rochester, Finger Lakes, uh, Central New York, Hudson Valley, Northeast, Northeastern New York, they do stuff that's similar but not always the same. So, you know, if someone has a question, I would urge them to call our office. I've worked in chapters across the state and everything is done a little bit differently. So even if we can't do it or vice versa, we will make sure that we link you with someone who can. Uh, aside from my job doing what I do, I also um, am a care consultant with the chapter. So I take shifts on the phone and do care consultations with folks. So if someone calls, it's probably for one of these reasons. I get a lot of caregiver stress and emotional support, a lot of safety concerns. We have a really strong partnership with the Center for Elder Law and Justice here in Dunkirk and up in Buffalo to provide free legal supports for folks. If they go through CELJ or if they go through us, it's always free. Um, and we're able to kind of help ferry that along because people have questions and I will be honest with you guys, I'm a social worker. If you ask me about a Roth IRA, I don't know. I don't, I have one and I don't know. So the more that we talk to CELJ, they're able to talk about certain things like legal and financial um, concerns, questions, anything like that, we'll send you right over to them. Um, the other thing that I honestly love about what we do is family conflict. So it's not clinical in nature, but what we will do, and this is my favorite thing because I've done this a couple times, is I will sit down with a family, it doesn't matter how many there are, I've done it with as big as a group of 14, or just you know a son and a father are caring for the mom. Um, and oh, one of the hardest things about caregiving is not being on the same page with your family, but I expect them to do what I need them to do, but they don't know, but they also have opinions. It's this whole thing. So we'll get everybody in a room, and I will sit there and I will lay it all out for you. Does that mean we're all going to agree? Definitely not but it does mean that they have all the information. Everyone is on the same page. I'm gonna say some things that are sometimes hard truths for folks. They can blame me because they never have to see me again. But if it means that mom is getting the compassionate care that she needs, that they're you know, fully informed of what they're facing, that means I've done my job. So it helps to resolve that family conflict in those, those moments of planning and those moments of you know, really tough disagreement and if they want to come back, that's perfectly fine too. I'm never going to say, no, you can't come back for a second one. It might be with somebody else, but at the end of the day, you know, all of these reasons are, are reasons that are very valid. And there are plenty that aren't listed on there, but if you notice anyone that's dealing with this, you know, send them our way. So we have a national 24 seven helpline. This is great. You can register for things. You can call and ask a quick question. You can say, hey, I have a neighbor who looks like they have, you know, they've dinged up their car a bunch and they've come over three times today asking for an egg. And every time I've given them an egg, but I keep asking for eggs. Whatever it might be, you can talk to them about signs, symptoms, or they can provide those care consultations to you as well. They'll transfer you to a team that's an LMSW like myself, um, and they'll say, hey, this is what we've got going on. We'll kind of walk you through that brief solution-focused therapy um, and say, hey, this is, this is what I'm hearing from you. Let's try this. If it doesn't work, call me back. So this is 24 seven. If folks are having a really tough time um, at three in the morning, you can always send me an email or a text. I, I will not answer you. And if I do answer, you really don't want me to because it's <laughs> not coherent, but they are always there. It's always fully staffed. We run a bunch of different caregiver support groups and the ones that we run here in Western New York are very specific um, because of the funding that we have, we're able to Kind of cater them to certain populations. So for instance, we have one for uh, just veterans. 
We have three groups for wives um, up in Amherst. We have to close the first two because they're so big um, that we opened up another one. We have one for folks who are um, living in the early stages of dementia, which is really great because some people want that emotional outlet to talk about, oh my gosh, how frustrating it is that Heather keeps trying to finish my sentences. And it's just on the tip of my tongue, not that you would ever do that, but it's a way for someone to still have that emotional support or talk about how the diagnosis makes them feel or how difficult it is sometimes for them to get through, you know, just even half of their day. The other support group that we hold that's really, we have tons more, but the one that I love um, and I write about quite often is we have a bereavement caregiver support group. Western New York has been really wonderful about letting people know that our caregiving journey does not stop when our loved one has passed. It has been, gosh, ooh, like eight years since my grandma passed from Alzheimer's, and still sometimes it just hits you like a wave. And that's okay, but the grief is different. There's this sense of anticipatory grief, there's this weird sense of relief, but loss, but guilt. There, there's many, many complicated emotions that come with it. So our caregiver bereavement support group is one of only like three in the nation. Um, and we're able to offer that to folks uh, so that they can kind of get that closure. And I think it makes it easier for them to, to then wrap up those complicated emotions and kind of take out what they need to process at one at a time. We offer a lot of education and trainings. We offer a sensitivity training to a lot of facilities. We offer professional training and working on accreditation, which is so much work. Um, and then we offer free education classes. So effective communication strategies, tips for tough conversations, um, how to do healthy living for your brain and body, what's good for your body, what's good for your brain. Um, I run a course on how to keep ourselves safe with technology. So that means in person, you know, using things that'll turn off the stove or what that means looking at credit cards or bank statements and all of these different things. So we talk about all kinds of stuff um, just to, to give people an idea of what is out there and then these safety services are unique to Western New York. I'm really excited about them. We have a Medic Alert uh, enrollment. It's called Medic Alert Wander Support, and we've all seen the bracelets that say, I'm Claire, I'm allergic to bees, or whatever the heck might be. Great. This is a bracelet that's a different color, and it says, I'm Claire, and I have a memory impairment. Getting the person who is living with dementia to wear it sometimes is like 50-50, but it's the enrollment in the service that's really helpful. My grandma would leave off. Um, and we did not know about this, but she would always go to the cat food aisle in Tops and Mayo. She needed cat food, and I was like, okay, I can find her. Everything's good. But Mayville's small. Jamestown, Lakewood is not. There are plenty of other places that are, are not small, and I don't always know where someone will be. Um, so you can enroll someone in this service, which is you send in a photo, their allergies, their medications, what they like to be called, home address, emergency contact. So if they are found wearing the bracelet, someone can call that number, but more likely than not, what will happen is the caregiver will call Medic Alert, they'll send out an APB to the police and you know first responders on scene, the hospitals, so that they have this person's information if they are found. And what I really like about this too is that it says, you know, oh my gosh, instead of rushing up to somebody and saying, oh, I've been looking for you, blah, 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 you be very calm, you be very respectful, realize that this person does not know that they're missing or maybe doesn't understand the severity of it. And so they're, they're treated with, with a lot of dignity that maybe we wouldn't get otherwise. And on the flip side of that, we also enroll the caregiver. So if I were the caregiver, my bracelet would say, I'm Claire and I'm a caregiver for someone with a memory impairment. So if I go to the store, I slip, I fall, I hit my head and I'm conked out and I need to go to the hospital, the first responder should see this bracelet and they'll call medical alert, which will trigger a well-being check to the home until I'm back. What should have been 20 minutes was four hours. My loved one is cared for for the whole thing. And then we also cover an ECMC driver evaluation. Currently, we're only offering this at ECMC. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a hike for some folks, but I will say it is completely worth it. One of the biggest conversations we have is trying to give up the keys. And it's very hard. If I told my dad today, I was like, hey, give me your truck keys. I would be hit by a plow. Mm -hmm. So it is what it is. But if the doctor ever told him to give up his truck keys, the doctor would not be hit by a plow and I could have somebody to blame as a family member. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have 
you know, this doctor that you're never going to see again, but they said that you can't drive anymore. I can't do anything about it. Let's place our feelings about losing this independence on someone else so we can preserve this family caregiving relationship. And it also says, hey, you know, maybe you are fine to drive for a little bit. Maybe it's just local streets at daytime. Maybe it's with someone else in the car. So it, it gives recommendations. We're never gonna yank somebody's license, uh, but you do have the option as the caregiver to have the results sent to your doctor so that they can maybe start that conversation with the DMV. Mm -hmm. If it's really bad, that's what we always suggest. We are super lucky to be able to also provide funding for community respites throughout all of Western New York. Right now, I think the one in Chautauqua County is just in Westfield, um, but we're looking to get some more up and running. Um, we have a bunch in Buffalo, we have a bunch in Cat County, up in Niagara. But these are programs where um, they're mostly held in churches. Folks have come together and said, I recognize that people need respite services. I also recognize that they can be wildly expensive, especially for the duration that people need them to actually relax. So they're volunteer run, we train all of the volunteers yearly, um, and we give them funding to be able to run these sites, offer a hot lunch, offer you know, meaningful activities. I don't wanna sit here and play crazy eights with you all day, unless that's what you want. Mm -hmm. But I wanna be able to offer things that actually engage someone that's not watching a movie. Uh, so we have all of those, and we will also pay for respite funding um, if someone really needs that next level. So we have contracted with um, Chautauqua County Adult Day Currently, I believe there's another option coming down the pipeline, but if someone is really having a tough time, their loved one does not want to stay home, or they need that respite care, or they just would benefit from socialization, we will help to offset the cost um, of that respite care. So all you have to do is call us, we send you to the Office for the Aging, you'll get a call from Jen Elman, um, who pretty much anyone recognizes at this point anyway, but she will kind of help be that local person to walk you through everything here at Chautauqua. But we do that throughout each county. Um, it can count for adult day, it can count for consumer directed, home care if it's medically necessary. I will say, of course, as we know, home care is really hard to find right now. So I would suggest going the other option. Or we'll pay for it. You can use it in one chunk if you want to go on vacation. Go on vacation. Please, oh my gosh, go on vacation because you need it as a caregiver. So if you know someone who's really burning out, um, send them our way. We had a gentleman who had called us who, um, who cared for both of his parents. Both of them had Alzheimer's. He lived down the street from them. And they could still function okay, but he wanted to go to California for his niece's wedding. And he couldn't take them, but he also couldn't leave them. And there was no one to watch them, and he couldn't afford respite in a facility. So he paid for both of his parents to have the same room in a facility, and they stayed there for 10 days together. And he got to go to California. And he sent us photos, and it was a beautiful wedding. But things like that, if, if you have something that you want to do or that's something you need to do, if you know you're gonna have hip surgery, I don't care what it is, we will also provide that funding for respite. And then we do have specialized programming for folks who are living with dementia. Um, any type, we have social engagement activities, we have a, a program all about kind of what to expect as things progress and we split into two groups. We have one for the caregiver, one for the person who's living with the disease and we're, we're very candid. You know, this is the time where you can ask these questions and not offend people. You can be as honest and as, as tough as you want to be. I always tell people bring tissues because um, it can get very emotional. It's, it's kind of that spot between getting the diagnosis with the neurologist and really seeing what's coming down the pike. So we're kind of here to bridge that gap. And then we also have that early stage support group. Uh, we have peer to peer outreach sometimes it's easier to talk about what I'm going through with just one person who's already going through it, who understands. Um, so we have some folks who are able to do that. And then we have a, a message board. Some people don't wanna do anything in person, and I get that. Uh, so this is a way to stay connected with folks and ask questions. I'll be honest with you, I look at both of these like once a week. I look at the caregiver side, I look at the person living with the disease side to see if there are themes, if there are questions that maybe you know, we haven't done a good job at answering or if there's something that people are really struggling with and maybe we can find a new service. So these are all really excellent, but a lot of these ones in the middle here are pretty much unique to Western New York. We also, um, in Western New York, give out animatronic pets. So they're little robot pets, my dog thinks it's real. Um, they're really cool. 
good, they're super, super cool, but it's meant to kind of drive down that anxiety and give someone something to fidget with. If you took away my dog from me right now, I would be beside myself. So I can't imagine moving into you know, any type of different environment, not having my pet. I don't know what I would do. So it's a really good way to curb that anxiety with change too. Uh, people give them as gifts all the time. I think they're like $125 if you buy it off Amazon. Out, ship it right from Amazon or we'll it to your house. So if you know someone who needs something like that, we have some at the OFA offices, but we'll also just ship one right to you. But that is, of course, uh, unique to Western New York. So with all of that being said, with all the services that we do, I still do want to drive home the fact that we are optimistic about things. Um, just because this disease has a progressive you know, trend, the, the way that it works is, is sometimes very long and it can be very difficult, but there will be a cure someday. We're at a really exciting time right now for research. We have three new FDA approved medications that don't just treat the symptoms, but actually stop the buildup of that amyloid in the brain. Um, super, super cool. They are not covered by CMS right now. Heather and I were just talking about that earlier. We're holding a rally in Buffalo on Saturday to advocate for coverage of these drugs because otherwise they're about $26,000 a year. Yeah, if you have 26, I mean, call me, please. Yeah. But it's crazy because the only way you can get these is through a clinical trial. So. There is something, there is progress. We just have to fight for it. So we do wanna be really optimistic with folks about that. And one of the ways that we, as a national service, we offer um, people to get involved with that. Some people really like the idea of being involved in clinical trials is through Trial Match. Um, it's a really wonderful service. You can just sign up, you put in a little bit about yourself and you say, hey, if there are clinical trials that I qualify for, this will let you know so you can choose whether or not to get involved. And then of course, going back to that healthcare discrimination slide in the beginning, we are really inclusive. I want to bring together as many folks as I possibly can. Alzheimer's affects everybody in one way or another. It doesn't discriminate on whether you're educated or uneducated, wealthy or poor. I mean, truly, I've never met someone who said, oh, I have no idea what that is. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're involving people in every way that we possibly can. So a couple of ways to do that um, you can advocate, so that CMS rally is really exciting. We have people coming from all over the state um, to advocate. I have sent many mean emails to <laughs> people who have not endorsed covering that. Um, they were articulate, but they were they were mean. Um, so why would you not do this? So if you have a master plan on aging, why not include this? But I digress. So you can advocate and kind of be that voice for folks who maybe aren't able to advocate for themselves anymore. You can volunteer. We always have positions like community educator, kind of giving this information to folks, um, community representatives. I drove down here a lot for health fair, so if someone ever wanted to table, great. Um, volunteer on walk day, it's a super fun day. Uh, right now we're hosting it in Dunkirk, but we're looking to do it one year in Dunkirk, one year in Jamestown, one year in Dunkirk, Jamestown, to kind of keep people involved. Um, and then you can just follow us and share our posts about what's going on. If that's you know the most you wanna do, that's actually still really, really helpful. Um, so in a nutshell, that is what we do. Does anyone have any questions? I do not. I have a comment I just need to share. Um, <laughs> when my in-laws were alive, they lived to be 86 and 93. And they were, uh, my brother-in-law lives near them. And they still lived on their own up until dad died. And um, I remember my brother-in-law would stop by every day to check on them. And he'd hear dad say, Bessie, did we eat yet? She say, it's six o'clock, we must have. <laughs> Cause they were just at that point. Yeah. I mean, you'll eat And no room. clue. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's so interesting to see people, you know, really step up to the plate and notice those little things about people that you really only notice once you do that check-in all. And it's it's just one of those fun memories to get to have too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I did send Heather an email, and I don't know Claire how you may or may not fit into this, but we're uh, currently working on two dementia homes here in our agency, and I know they've worked with a doctor who has given them a lot of information, 
but I didn't know if maybe Heather could hook you up with the right person. They may be able to utilize some of your services just from all of what I've seen here. I think you could be really helpful just in instructing staff how to support and not demean. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you say that actually, Debbie, because we have materials specifically for doing that in these kind of homes with this population because it, it does progress differently. Um, just like anything else, we're gonna, different populations experience this disease differently, whether it be through discrimination, progression, you know, health inequities, health access, all of these things, but dementia is, is a really tough bear to deal with behaviorally, but we have noticed a trend in behaviors and people really not understanding how to manage this um, and how to, consistently respond with compassion each time. So I would love that if you want to. I'll hook you up yeah. with uh, Joanne and Mark. I figured that's, that's where that. I'm thinking, yeah. If, yeah. you know, hook her up there and they would know where to go from that point because they're kind of the head of this whole thing. Yeah, I'll hook you up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thank Deb. You. Sure, I just think it'd be really great if we're heading that direction for a couple of our homes. I think the more training and more information and better understanding people working in those homes specifically could get. I just think that would just be so supportive of, you know, we're, we're watching. I, I don't remember, I think right now we currently have 13 people who are diagnosed mm -hmm. and, and a large number of them are Down syndrome people. So, you know, we, we just have to make sure if we're moving something in another direction that we have the support systems to go all the way until we are on our feet and get it. Oh, yeah, and even, you know, when you get folks, one of the things that actually isn't listed on the reasons people reach out, I hear a lot from professional caregivers, just the need to validate that what they're doing is correct. I think mm -hmm. sometimes we, we second guess ourselves, because there's so much information. I think people need to hear, okay, you are doing a good job, or you are doing this right. Take a breath, you're not gonna do it right every single time, but, the techniques that you're using work. They're proven to work. So even that kind of support is, is what we're here for. Awesome. Awesome. I think it'd be great. Thank you. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? I thought it was a fabulous presentation. Good. Thank you. No, thank you. I know Priscilla is probably agreeing with everything, but she doesn't have a uh, voice down there, a speaker. Uh, uh, audio um, <laughs> bar thumbs up, giving thumbs up but I, if you if she could see your face she would actually know there's two people in there so she doesn't think only a couple people came yeah worth it yeah totally worth it thank you claire yeah. for making the drive down um thank you